feel like I could have bought one off of him. He'd probably been for this. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, uh, I usually make a pretty deep hole for my trap. Kind of a step down type set that's been around for a long time. The Leggett's in Maryland, they've made that pretty famous, but there was guys doing it long before the Leggett's. That, that old Dick Atkins from over here in Leola, he had a book he called it the Basement Step Set. So just picture that with Doug out with the trowel there. <clears throat> Make a deep bed. Deep, deep bed, yeah. Use anything to cover the trap? I don't. Or put the dirt like a piece of wax paper? I don't do that now. Or a cap or anything to I, keep it I don't mess with that. I just, I just put this because this is pretty light. We, we trap in a lot of areas where it's wet and damp and, okay. I mean, bottom land and yep. marshy areas and stuff like that. I found that the wax paper, like, helps keeps the moisture from coming up into your dirt. There you go. So I lay it over top of the, yep. the cool spring, you know, the cover almost to the jaws. Yep. And then put the, the sifted dirt back on top okay. of that. That might definitely be it worse. keeps it from, like, freezing and, and uh, sure. And getting where are you from? I I'm, I trap in Delaware, so okay, so it's wet and flat. Like yeah, it, it, marshy areas, marshy, bottoms, yep. bogs. Yep. You know, like crossover points. Yep. And stuff like that, around ponds There's and beaver, of, beaver. A lot of fox in Delaware because they were protected. Yeah, that's fox back. hunting country, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Ten or twelve years. Ago. Chase only. Okay. Yeah. Yep. For about seventy-five years. Yeah. <laughs> you can't go out and just. Shoot fox. That was one of the biggest yeah. finds you would get in Delaware. Shoot the red fox. Yeah. 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 Possession of a red fox was, yeah, that was illegal that for was like a hundred years. Is that right? The old yeah. English yeah. tradition. Yeah. I think that'd be about like going out King Ranch. The dude that does the hay set yeah. said yeah. Delaware yeah. breeds yeah. fox for Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah they do. They do. <laughs> they do. That's what we do. There's the northwest wind thing again. Most times, right. stuff's traveling with their nose into the wind and they're coming up out of Delaware yeah. and out of Chester County. And that's one reason we haven't yeah. had a fox. Right. That's definitely true. And, you know, I've read them studies and stuff where them guys would tag them and they, them young fox will run 50, 60 miles a night. Wow. Right. That's a long way. Yeah. You know, a couple of nights from yeah. Delaware, he's up here. All right. right. Wait if he's going into the wind. They travel the waterways, too, like the Brandywine. Exactly. The White Clay Creek. Yep. This this here's a trickles into the Brandywine. Right. This is a headwater of the Brandywine right here at Dave's Pond. Ah, yeah. that little creek that yep. runs through yep. here? Yeah. Around here down by Cambridge. Right. And heads east. Yeah, and because, right over here, well, there's a lot of fox around place. the Brandywine. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> You're right. So, yep. Yeah, so the basins of the set, I mean, most of you guys probably you know the basins of the set. Uh, I just dig this hole, I kind of use a shovel trowel, so it's quick, you know, I just pop, pop that hole out. And then generally I'll, like if this was for fox, I would dig the hole probably about right here. For coyote, maybe back in here a little more, just for a little more distance. But I generally dig my hole just with a stake, like this. Because half the time the ground's hard as it could be, hard, hard digging with a trowel. This set's not going to look the best here to get started, but... See, this ground's real hard right here. I should have went off in the sod, maybe. You young guys will think this is a kind of an ugly-looking set, but I'm telling you, the way the set looks a lot of times isn't really what's the main thing. It's keeping your traps working and keeping good lure. These traps, but I like I like this one for you. Um, you just want to make sure your jaw is sitting pretty level. If it's tucked up, like if it's way up in the air, that means this has to be adjusted a little bit. If it's down low, you don't want it low, of course, like he said about putting wax paper over. If the traps, if the if this sits down in here, the slightest little thing could Keep it down with the farm. Yeah. You know, like, you have to bring it in there. Like, you know, Take care, Roger. So, that's level. The whole thing of the trap bed, make your trap bed dished on the bottom. Don't, don't dig it out perfectly flat. 
keep the dish because the bottom of the trap's not perfectly flat. You want to set it in there and just give it a little twist and that'll bed it. So I just I just set them in like this and just kind of twist it. And this ground's real hard, but that's that's just like it is in real trapping, especially like coyotes. I mean, buddy, just trapping coyotes like on them wood roads that are all hard and hard to dig and hard to or like out west, it's hard as could be. So you have to adapt to whatever you got hard ground. You just see that trap's bedded pretty good now. It's kind of it's the ground so hard that it didn't see. And I would probably just push a stone under this loose jaw yet. That's pretty pretty solid. You don't want just, that trap with any movement. Right, that's the idea. <clears throat> yep, a solid trap. And if ground's this hard, you know, I'll do something like that. My stake would be driven in right about here. Is that the way you set your trap on an angle? Yeah. With the dog towards right. By nature, I'm not sure if there's really a reason, but I end up always setting it like that. Uh, I see guys at different shows. They put the dog in. Right. The other way. I, I, I guess each his own. In each his own, and it's what you get used to. Right? Well for you. Yeah. You have kind of little theories, and you're not really sure if they mean something or not. But mine is uh, the this. I don't really want his toenail to catch this. You know, like, like say he gets to digging here, and if the ground was a little softer, I could illustrate it even a little better. Uh, because a lot of times my hole and my trap bed kind of all run together. How, how, how diameter your hole? Uh, just like what, pretty much what I can ream out with a stake. Like, I suppose. And your wind direction, theoretically, if he's really want, he can smell it here. But if he really wants to get a good snoop full. He's going to have to get around here, and the hole's small, so most likely he's going to have to start working on it a little bit. You know, if it's real big, he might get his curiosity satisfied quicker, theoretically. So the way this trap's setting like this, if he does start scratching at it, you know, if he starts wanting the largest hole, I, I'm, my theory is he's less chance of his toenails catching this if it's a little off the side. And this, this is the very worst place for the fox to step, right there. Right there. It's the worst place because if he steps there, the trap fires and the, the trigger... This is... Yeah. Boy. Yep. So that, theoretically, is a little bit off to this side. This is a little bit off to <coughs> this side. It kind of gives him a clear shot here. But it's kind of... Because if you trap in the snow, you see they walk all over the place. Pull back here and they pee back here and come around here. And so you just try to put the odds in your favor best you can. And we hope he's digging with the one fall and he steps in the trap with exactly. that fall. Yep. I think really what you hope for is to get him before he does anything. So right. He just kind of comes trotting in here and stops a little bit, steps a little bit, steps and bam, he got it. Right. Because once he starts digging, that's when you get the they dig it and they dig the trap out by accident. They're not really know the trap's there. They're just digging around. Right. You know, skunks and coons flip the trap out. They're digging up the place dirt. But, uh, so, yeah, that's that's basically. I'm sick. I just bed the trap and make sure it's solid. And I don't have to use a sifter, but this dirt's all pre sifted. I just tamp it in there. If you use a wax paper or a pen cover now, sure, just scoot it. Okay. Stick a leaf over. Good. Leaf over. Underneath. underneath. You can do that. Yep. You can do that. My, my theory is if it rains, even almost at all, like anything over a cool drink, I'm remaking the set. So. And you use dry dirt all the time? Yep. You, you don't shift those dirt. You use it. No, just this. Unless I just am low on it or, you know. I mean, I have sifted. But I just think it's better I have to go like this. That's what it seems like, yep. And it's clean. And it's clean, yep. Now to me this is almost like a better coyote set than it is a box set because the way I ended up digging this in and I have the distance, that distance. That's really yeah, that's pretty far yeah. for me for fox. That's a good that's a pretty good fox set though. Or a pretty good coyote set. So you only want the hole like an inch away. For fox, yeah. For fox. Yeah. If if this was a fox set, let's say this is our fox set now since we're if this was the fox set, but if that was a fox set, I would probably have the trap right about, right about like that. Pretty close. You know what I mean? Same depth though. Same depth. Yep. And then the whole thing kind of turns into one hole.
Right. Like this, this just kind of flows out, and the, the trap's definitely below the surface of the ground. See, the, the, my pan's right about there. It's pretty far below the surface. Right. Is that about the right depth? That'd be about right, yeah. About two inches below. Oh my God. Inch, I, I'm going to about a half inch or so. Half inch, yeah. Any, 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 just so it's a little low. And it can be exaggerated. I, I, some of mine are deep. I know a buddy of mine, he, he come into a farm where I was trapping. He said, I didn't even think you were trapping there. Your steps looked like junk, you know. I said, well, that's how much look. <laughs> they, they catch, after they catch a few fox, they all look like junk anyhow. Right. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, the dirt, if you catch, if you catch eight or ten fox, especially if it's been half muddy, it looks like a yeah, bottle. It's right. no use cleaning up. It, you know, that's, You'll have, you'll have this stuff all laying around, but just as long as the smell's there, the trap's bedded, and there's no obstruction in the trap bed, you put that lure back down the hole. Now for cats, they say, if you guys are interested in cats, they say you can block them a little bit, and you should actually block them. Like we, I did a little bit of cat trapping out west because five, and I went out there years ago. <clears throat> it was fun, you know, it was great. But you can block them like with with obstacles, pretty much, and I know some guys are doing this with fox and coyote too, but like these these cats, they're so finicky, they don't spend much time in a set, you know, they just, more like a house cat, they just, you know, they step around, they're not bold like your dog, that's how these cats will see, you guys will actually like kind of, kind of more, put more blockage in a set, to, to like force his foot. Well, so that's that's one of the only differences in cat trap. Put a rock in back in yep. a hole. Yep. Maybe a big rock here. Yeah. yeah maybe a big rock big here. Rock. Yep. Yep. Something that you know. And then a few a few things right. Let's say that's what's like one big, you know, that he definitely is not going to stand here probably. Right. And and you know, it's kind of a combination of a walk through set and a third hole set. You know, you got a little bit of lure to get his attention. And the best thing with cats, uh, cats are kind of like mink. They run along the walls and stuff. They run along the edges. So if there's a uh, pretty big rock here, that's right where that cattle be. Just like mink on the edges of the bridges. You know, they just run along the edge. So we'll say, like if this was a cat set, if there was a, if there was a pretty big rock here, this would make it ideal. He'd be traveling along here anyhow. And now I just give him a little lure to stop him and I have a little bit of a walk through area here he can maybe that trap might not be quite as deep he might be you know he might stop because they don't stay long at a set so they'll they'll use bait i don't just use, use bait, a lot just lower lure. just lure yep i use uh this is king on call probably i use a lot of king on call uh i use some of dave's lures just put lure in the hole just put lure in the hole so urine outside or not? I, I just if I use urine, it's right in the hole. My favorite is uh is that's that's an old Promix bottle, but I just I get a little bit of Promix or or a little bit of gland lore, and then I just keep mixing the urine from the fox I'm catching. And I'm you know just nothing on the back in there, no. Nope, just right everything down the hole to try to get them to swing their rear end around and work it the right way. What's your reason for doing a double set? Well, there's about three or four reasons. One is you're stopped there anyhow. You're, you got your equipment out anyhow. Real quick to just, you know, I'd walk up, put a trap here, throw a trap over there, throw a stake over there, dig this up, throw my hammer over there. You know, you're real, you can do a real quick two sets. That's one. Another is uh, if you catch a possum in this set, you've got another set real close by to catch a fox because uh, every animal attracts yeah, other animals. animals. That yeah. happens. These and you've things. had uh, possum or something oh, yeah. in this set, yeah. and got a yep. possum. Possum, yeah. dogs. Yeah, I would think yeah, you're on your own. I'm cats. Fox. <laughs> yep. Even dogs and cats. I think the dog probably comes after the fox. But a lot of stuff the fox comes after what's caught. And he, he, he's checking out. Why is that possum sitting there all night? You know, whatever. Right. Coon. You often catch two coon. You know, a couple coon driving together on the ridge. And one of my best sets. I had grass a little higher than this. Good pinch point. I took a weed whacker, made about a six foot diameter circle, one about ten foot away. Good eye appeal. Yep. Coon or possum, fox, but they were the hot set. Yep. I had this down just 
almost to the ground with a weed whacker. Sure. I didn't know what to do. I'm like I said, I'm new to this. I made the, made the circle. Yep. Got a six to eight foot diameter. Made another one over here. It's got doubles quite yep. often. Not that you know, not fox, but oh, one animal and then yeah. another. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course you get your two fox too, you know, one fox gets caught at yeah, no. seven, eight o'clock at night and he's out there yipping a couple times and another no, fox. No. Yep. And another reason yeah, is if, if one trap snaps off, if it's a good location, no matter how good a trapper you are, you're gonna have snap traps. They step at the wrong place, uh, a, a skunk comes along, he's digging at the dirt, you know, right after dark, he snaps the trap off. Well if it's a really good location, there you lose that whole night. You got another trap nearby. I think it'd be worth putting three in a lot of times if you're not worried about theft. And if you have the traps and you take a little time, put it in two traps. You know, yep. instead of using two traps at the same set. Exactly. Yep. But then you then you've got a good chance of something working. You got a good chance of maybe catching two fox. Um, there's 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 just numerous reasons, you know, to. Put yeah, because I've done that before. You know, put two traps at the same set. You know, clip one trap off. You mean right at the exact same set? Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. And then get caught in the other one yep. because I had it so far apart. I, yep. I spread them out, like one over that way, one over this way. I guess. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yep. The only reason I don't do that. But I was bait. using bait, too. Okay. I, I think was using muskrat meat for bait. Okay. Yep. Or ducks or something. Yep. That's probably fine, too. It just, it, it does take a lot of time. Yeah, you're, it does. You're kind of sitting here for quite a while. Right. And then you're... I like the idea of yeah. making two sets. Just make two sets. With two, two traps. Yep. Uh, These are Bridger number two, fully modified. They have the laminations and everything else on them. But this, when a fox steps in here, he's fully committed. He's not standing on the jaw, on the jaws where the jaws could pop him out when it springs. His foot's totally in there. Whereas if you use the smaller one and a half, there's a much a bigger diff, a big difference between the opening that he can stand in. A big difference in the jaw space. Where if he's standing in here, he could be standing on the jaw here at the same time. And when you get the hay on top of this, when I make the set, it could pop him out when it springs where this comes up around me. So I basically find the spot I'm going to set. Like I said, it can be anywhere you set any other set for a fox. In a cornfield, I use, even though it's hay, I can make it in a cut down cornfield. I can make it in the woods along the stream bank. I can make it out in the pasture. It doesn't matter. The hay has to just the hay, hay, the hay set to use hay to make it. I'll take two of these traps at each for one set and set them. My chains are like 10 inches long, so they'll be 10 inches away from the hay bale when I set this up totally. That's just the distance, is just a number. I determined work best for me. Some people go longer, some people go shorter, but I like the 10 inches because it works yeah. out for what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So, That's what you have. I will set yeah. it up face like that. Well, I and use, I could use, I used to that use one stake in the middle here yeah. to hold the two traps. I found out that once you catch a fox in the first one, he usually runs around and gets caught in the second one. So, to make it a better chance to catch a double, in the same set, I take it, and once I get my spacing, just flip it out, and I'll stake it down out here, and turn this one around, and stake it down out here. That way, if I catch one in that trap, the fox running around has less chance of getting tangled up in that one. So if another fox can even investigate, I can end up catching a double. So I set these on top of the ground. I don't know if you guys were up with the other fox demonstration where he beds everything and packs it down in. I do not bed them. I don't dig any holes at all. I just set them on top of the ground. This ground here is grass, so it's kind of hard and it's deep down. We're in a field. It lays a lot better than that. It doesn't look as bad. But even when it's laying like this, if you want it to make it less wobbly, you can shove hay underneath it or you can take your hammer that you drive your stakes in with and beat the ground down. And then the springs and stuff will sit in there better so the trap lays flatter if you want it to. But I don't worry about it. I just set it like that and stake them down. Then I take what used to be a full slice of the hay bale and I stand it in the middle. And then I'll take these sticks, which I have here. I will push them in the ground after I put the hay bale in there. Right now I just stuck them in there because this ground is so hard. I had to use my driver. To make holes, I just leave the stakes in there. But if the ground's usually 
it's not rock hard. I can stick them in without doing it, without using this. If it's frozen, I'll use the dry pilot holes so they stand in. The purpose of this fix is just to hold the slice in place so it don't blow away in the wind. <coughs> Once I get that set up, I take additional hay that's already well, it's laying on its end. I'll just sprinkle this around over top of the traps. I won't cover the traps totally. It's just to break up the pattern. And then I'll spread the rest like get a circle around here like you see where the hay is laying. That is basically the way the traps look when it's all done. Then I use urine and glandular mixed together in a squirt bottle and it's just squirt a stripe down this top of the hay bale. So the fox comes in, he's trying to get up top there where the scent is. And as he's stamping around, he steps on the traps and gets caught. So that's basically the whole set. There's nothing to it but that. There's nothing hidden here. What you see here is what I do. I don't do anything different when I'm making this set on the line and I'm out setting traps for myself. I don't spray anything on the side of the bale. It's just all strictly on the top so he has to work to get up there to get to the set. Does that work better out in the open where they can see the hay better or does it really matter? Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll set in open fields like I'll wait, I won't, I'll set when cornfields are cut down. I mean, everything's usually open. Because I set it, I have limited time in the morning to check traps, so I set it so I can see it from a distance, so I don't have to go right up to it. If I, because usually when you catch something, he starts running around, this hay bale gets knocked down. So if you can't see the fox, if the hay bale's down, you know something's up there, or at least something was there. And usually he's laying there when I get up there. But I usually set it in open areas where I can see it from a long distance, so I don't have to walk up to it all the time. But I have set them in the woods, along a little stream on top of the banks where the fox I know he travels follows the streams at times. But anywhere you can anywhere you want to make a fox set a dirt hole you can put this in. But I, I stay like I wouldn't be this close to that tree line if I was setting this spot. I would move it like twenty feet out so that the possums and stuff I don't tra attract them into it. I just want to mean try to catch the fox like careful possums. I've caught possums in it but the further I stay away from this Head rows and tree lines, the better off I am with it. Pennsylvania, anybody certified? Okay. These are not snares because they do not kill the animal. They just hold the animal. They have a relaxing lock here, so when the animal gets caught, it doesn't lock down. You can always, you can back it off where a snare has a lock that crimps down. The more he pulls, the tighter it gets, and eventually chokes him out. So the obviously the reason behind that is if you would accidentally catch a hunter's dog or something in these, the hunter can get there and release it without harming the dog, whereas if it's a snare the hunter, the dog, the head of the hunter, he may not get there in time to release it without killing it. So you can only use these in Pennsylvania after the day after Christmas the season opens and it ends on the end last day of talking. These are only four fox and coyotes, you know, just a seven for raccoons or anything like that, yeah. or any other animal. Right. If you accidentally catch something, I'm you're allowed to keep it before you're supposed to let it go. You weren't supposed to be able to kill it or anything like that. But, so, you're supposed to use, and the yeah. loop size it's when you're good. setting is supposed to be six mm -hmm. to ten inches in diameter. I, use, it's I try to keep them around eight, it's and it must be set a minimum of six it's inches it's off the ground, and maximum of ten. I again use keep it eight inches off the ground. So when I'm setting these, I look for a trail going through a field, a deer trail. If it's a cow pasture where the cows have a trail and the cows aren't going to be out there anymore, I'll use them. They've cut weed whack trails through here, so I can just use them as a demonstration. So. Basically, I have a rebar stake, the same as I use for the fox, but on top of it I have this piece of number 9 wire wrapped around to be my support wire to support the cable. It's flexible so I can bend it any way I want. And then I have a regular inline swivel on the end of it so that I can run it through the stake it down. My hammer has these three marks. This is 6, 8, 10 inches above the ground, so I don't have to measure. I can just line it up here. So you find a trail like this. And normally the trail in the field you're going to find is probably only a lot narrower than this. They have to do with a weed whack, so it's a lot wider. But you find a trail where you think the fox, or you know the fox is running, it drives the stake in with the swivel around it, so that the, once it's caught, you have plenty of room to swivel. 
I have this support wire. There's a piece of rubber hose on the cable so that you can hook it on here and hold it in place. I can pull this out anywhere I want it. So I get that to roughly an 8 inch loop size. And then take my hammer, set it in the middle of the trail. And then with the support wire, I can bend it up, bend it down, move it any way I want to get it to sit in the trail where I want it. Once I get it where I want it, that's close to the 8 inches, it's higher than the 6, so it's okay. I leave it. I don't try to camouflage that, because, like, again, the trail that I'm sitting on is a lot narrower, so that's, like, right over the center of the trail. And when the fox walks down, he sticks his head through it and gets caught. He doesn't smell it? Smelly. The way I treat these is when I get them new out of the... I buy... I don't make my own. I buy them from Dave, and I just take them and throw them in the, the dishwasher at home with regular dishwasher soap to get the, it takes the shine off and it gets the grease out of them and then I hang them outside for a couple weeks before I use them and that's all I do. And I don't, I don't paint them, I don't try to hide them, I just stick them there. When I first set this, the first time I used these, I thought it was like impossible that the fox was actually going to stick his head in there because where I set it was more on an area like this where the grass was low, you just see the trail, it didn't have these weeds and it's like there's no way he's going to walk in there. He did. Put his head right in it. So when he gets in there, he goes through and pulls and it just comes down. He pulls it off that support wire and he just starts running around. You're not allowed to set this anywhere you can get entangled. Like these weeds are okay because the cable cut it down. But if there's a tree in the way, you can't set there. You can't set near a fence. You can't set on a log going across the stream where he can jump off because he can get entangled or hang himself and they don't want that to happen. So he just runs around and ends up with a big, this is five foot long, so he ends up with a ten foot circle and cut down weeds. And then you got to catch up to him to stop him so you can kill him whatever way you choose to do that. But when he's running around in a trap, he has 10 inches of chain to run on, which is easy. You can back him up. Here he just keeps going back and forth. So what I do is take one of these with me out in the field when I'm checking my field. I just drive it into where he's running around and then just chase him down so he wraps himself up and it's real close so he can't run around and jump. So I can dispatch it, how to get him out of the cave. These only work for one catch because it gets all kinked up. So you can always cut the parts off and use them to make your own if you want to. And then the other thing that's good, you always end with certain lengths of the stuff with it. You can make the cable stakes out if you want to make your own. But they're only good for one catch. Before you just, like once you, if you see one of these after you catch one, he chews on it, he yanks it, it gets all kinked up, it has big chew marks, it's frayed in places. But, these work well if you have a place where you can set them where you know he's running. If they can slide back and forth, how does he not get out of it? Because he's pulling. He can't he back up. <laughs> if he backs up, it, it, do, it yeah. doesn't back up. Like I'm, I'm pulling this back, but he's pulling and going forward, so it just doesn't lock around his neck and choke him out. But if he backs up, see, I pull. If I'm a fox backing up, it's not loosening up on his neck. Unless he had, had hands and couldn't do that. But. Alright, I'm not looking. Have you ever had one get in? Not that I'm aware of. And these have, they're all rated, these ends are rated so that the deer gets caught in here accidentally, this is supposed to pop off. I don't know how you know that because I caught a deer once by the leg and he didn't pop off. <laughs> <laughs> he ripped the stake out of the ground, bent this in half. This is like at a 90 degree angle. When I found it, and the only reason I found it was a little bit of snow on the ground. You could follow where the stake was bouncing off the ground before it finally fell off his leg. But he destroyed everything. So. It didn't pop off like it was supposed to. But, but these are a very effective tool to use if you're certified. If I, if we could use these all year long, I don't think I would set a foot trap. I would use these instead. It's that much, to me, it's that much easier. You can throw a hundred of these in a backpack and walk across the field and no one knows what you're doing. And even if you, they, they try to see, if they see you from a distance and you step, if they can come looking for it, they probably ever find them because they blend in. Whereas that haze, like I said, the visibility, that's easy to find. Even a dirt hole, the visibility, if they go looking for it, they're going to find it. And these cost a dollar compared to those traps there, like $19 a piece. So if they steal this, I'm not, don't steal as bad as they steal that. In the winter time, you just basically look for the trails, or what if you have a patch of grass? I guess you take weed. I mean, winter time it's dead, pretty much. If you you can make your own trails, but you should make them 
in advance so that they know it's there when they start using it. The only time it's different is like if it snows, the uh, the field, the farms I, I trap on, I'm allowed to drive across, drive on. So I'll drive my truck and make tire tracks and set these right in the tire track. So they'll walk down that tire track. I mean, you can see if you follow a farm lane where a tractor drives out there, if you walk out there in the snow, you'll see that the fox is walking right down the same tire. So I'll just do that with my truck where I can drive. Set them down. Because if you have a deep down trail like this in grass or in the field, and it snows, you go out there, the fox won't run that trail no more. You'll see in the snow, they're going all over the place. Because I guess their scent stations are all covered up by the snow and they can't smell anymore. What'd you say you put the tape at on the ham hammer again? Uh, my hammer is six, six, eight, ten. Six, eight, and ten for the Six is the minimum you have to be, ten is the maximum you can be, so I picked eight in the middle. The same with the loop when you set it, six is the minimum loop you're supposed to use, ten is the maximum. If you make the loop too big on these, the fox will walk and somehow, instead of getting by the head, you're getting behind. Yeah. And then that makes it a lot. I've never damaged a fox when I had him by the neck, but by the back, by the back legs when he's running around, his fur gets rubbed and you get right. big rub marks in it. That's what I was wondering if it didn't rub him around the neck, but it don't. No. no. I've never had a problem with the neck. I mean, it gets tight there, and then once you get it off, once the skin, you can brush that right out. But when it's on the back, by the back hind legs, it's cuts in the belly it just too cuts much. everything. You can feel it on Now you have, you know the beaver are coming along here, they're coming out here. So what you can do is, you may see it all muddy here, shine down to the dirt. If this was all just grass and there was no opening here, just make your own opening. And shine it up, make it wet, kick some water up there. Now you've gone from them coming up anywhere they're going to come right to here, figuring the other guys are already here. So now you want to set it. You can This is very quick and easy, but this is kind of overkill for this kind of set. But you could use it. This is a rocky bottom. People may have the tendency, if you hit a rock, and you're going to get that, you're going to put your foot in here and push. And then you're going to catch your foot. You don't want to do that. That's why this is kind of overkill. But you can use this here. This is mainly designed for more open channels. A beaver is going to instinctively dive to the bottom when that trap is in the right. So you're going to want to put this trap all the way at the bottom. So uh -huh. if you have deep water that you can't get down and set it, that's where this is going to come in. You may be walking along here and you're walking and then all of a sudden you go down. Uh -huh. well, you know that's where the beaver are running and that's where this will come in. You'll find that channel and you'll put that right in there. Okay. Now he's going to swim the bottom. And then what you want to do is some guys will put what they call a dive stick on here. I'm just going to use this as a regular stick. But you just get a, a non-green piece of wood. A dead stick. If it's green, they're going to want to eat it. Then you just put this here, and it'll float. You can wire it on. You can put it in like this. When they see that stick, they're going to not go over it. They're going to go under it, and they're going to go all the way to the bottom. They instinctively swim along the bottom. That's how those channels get there. That's a, that's a good area to use one of those in, where you can't get to the bottom with your arms or anything like that. So that's where you would use a stand like that. But to set something like this, it's just a regular slide. You have your trap with you. Make sure the spring safeties are off. I like putting the trigger at the bottom. So when he's looking through there, he's not seeing that big hunk of metal. Now, you want to put that right in there. Take your T-bar. You don't even need a hammer. I wouldn't normally have those footholds in there if I was sitting 330. I need to just push these in. 
and you're really only stabilizing the track. And then I use an additional stake to secure the trap to the land. That's a different one. Look at that. So if it does fire, he's not going to go anywhere with it. Sometimes there's a tendency how you catch them, it'll flip and spin and it'll pull the stakes out. Because you don't want to put them that far in that you can't get them out. You just want to stabilize the track. When that fires, they'll be caught. You want to ultimately go for what they call a suitcase catch. Behind the neck and across the ribs. Going through. Sometimes you might get catch the head. It might take a little longer for him to die. So you want to make sure the trap is secure. It's very quick compared to what I'll show you with a foothold trap. Wow. The loops? You just want that top of that a couple inches out of the water. Well, that's the thing. Some they say it has to be completely submerged. Now, I could leave it like this. Tomorrow we, it could be that much underwater. Or tomorrow it could be that much out of the water. Depending. That's why it's so difficult to deal with these things because of the regulation. Everybody's interpretation of the law. The best thing would be is to have it completely submerged and put a dye stick over it. You'll see that stick? Okay. It's going to go under. That's as far as I can get it down. Yeah, that's why I didn't know if you're putting it close to the bank like that, you couldn't get it that far down. Right. You yeah. have to just back it up then. Mm -hmm. And they say put a dive stick over it. So that's pretty much your threat. Pretty now, you know they're going in and out of here. Now, if you had an area where, like in Maine, we'll drive along, we'll either actually see the beaver, we'll watch the beaver, or we know there's beaver there, but you don't want to be walking. So we'll yeah. make a dirt hole set for beaver without the dirt hole. That too, that box or the hole. Or the, you're making, you're going to lure the beaver in here, is what you're going to do. And that's called a caster mound set. Beavers identify their area. They, they take a bunch of leaves and sticks and they make a mound and then they put mud on it and then they put their caster on it. The caster is just like a musk and it says, hey, I'm here. So what you're doing is you're putting another musk down. And when they patrol at night, they run the edges, listening for water flowing out, looking for breaks and dams. And he's going to smell that, and he's going to want to investigate that. So now you're actually luring that beaver in there. So you're going to make your set the same here as far as the 330 goes. Same exact set. But now you're, you're going to make what they call a caster mound. And by doing the caster mound, you just take a bunch of debris, All this, all this muck here, and you're going to make maybe a pizza-sized mound of, of leaves and, and sticks and grass, and then you're going to want to get mud off the bottom. And since this is a rocky bottom, it's very hard. But you're going to make maybe a six-inch mound of muck, and that's where the, the caster is going to go. That keeps it up high. The beavers know that, and it keeps it, it keeps it moist, so it smells better. And now you're going to have your mound of caster, big pile here, and you just take your beaver caster. You're going to put some on. This caster here is a liquid because it. Once we get beaver and we get the, the caster, it dries out. We ground it in a meat grinder, the old can grinder. Stuff that's left over, the fatty sacks, the junk, we grind that up and we just put it in glycerin and we use it as an enticer. When you're making a caster mound set, you want to put it heavy with scent. But sometimes we'll just make a set and we'll just put a little bit of uh, caster on. Just even on a slide with no caster mound, we may put a couple drops of caster up there. That's what we use this, this stuff for. So we're not wasting the good stuff just to lure that beaver up there. So now you have your caster mounds, and that is what 
he's going to do. He's going to go up there. We've watched them. We've watched actually beavers in Maine do what they're supposed to do. But they don't always do that. We watched a, a mink in Maine that was supposed to do what it's supposed to do. We watched a mink at one of our sets that was supposed to go through. It just went over and went on its way. So you can't predict what they're going to do. But that's pretty much it as far as working with the 330s. If you know where the beaver are, they're very easy to catch. They're like muskrat, but bigger. They're hard to get out because depending on the weight um, and the traps are heavier, all the equipment's heavier. So I'll show you now using a foothold that you might not be able to use a 330. Once I grab the 330 here, I usually grab it so this, the trigger releases. So now the only way I'm, I know I'm going to get caught if I mess around with this trap. So I feel that pressure on my hand and I know that trap is ready to go. And then I hold it and I set the safety springs. And then I know I can release it. But I have my own way of doing things. But as long as I know that pressure's in that my hand, I know it's ready to get me. And it constantly makes me think I gotta take care of this trap. So that's the 330. Now with the foothold. Again, it, it depends on the wall. I like using the 330. They're quick, they kill them right away. Are they quick to chew their leg off to get out of a foothold? Well, most of the time when you think, see things like that, it's not that they're chewing their foot off, oh. they're spinning out of it. Mink, that's why I put a lot of swivels, especially fisher, like even with the conibears, I have two swivels on them. And if it's a foothold trap, they're going to spin. And they spin till the trap gets hung up, and then they spin till they break the bone, and then they spin till they rip the flesh. It's not really them chewing it off above the trap. Below the trap, they chew because they have no feeling here, but they're not going to chew through their leg that they can feel. That's why it's, it's, you need the right size trap. You wouldn't want to you know, use a number two for mink because he's got all that room to get his head under there. That's why you use a number one that he can't get under there to chew. So now with the foothold trap, I use a number three bridger and it's double swivel. What I like to go for is the hind foot. When you catch them by the hind foot, they have one thing on their mind, and that's getting out of there. They know something's got them, and they want out. If you catch them by the front foot, they're going to see it, and they're going to want to deal with it. That's where you get them spinning. That's where you get them breaking their foot. Uh, when we were in New York last year, we came with uh, someone else's set. He had a beaver in it, and he was just ready to, to get out of it just almost through with flesh. So we just shot it and left it lay there for the guy. And eventually he, we met him two days later with his boys and he said, did you shoot the, and we said, yeah. And he said, thanks and all that. But again, you're not supposed to do that either. But if we didn't, he was gonna lose it. And more importantly, the beaver was gonna get out without foot. So use a number three bridger. When this is set, That's just about as big, if not a little smaller, than the hind foot of a beaver. That's why they're trying to get bigger traps in Pennsylvania for beavers. That's a pretty big foot for a hind foot. And then you need a, a slide wire. This is called a drowning rig. This is just quarter inch cable. And I just take a piece of steel, I bend it on a 90 in the vise. Well, first I drill two holes. I drill a hole on each end, put it in the vise, bend it on a 90. Put it on the cable, put a quarter inch nut on there, smash it down with a hammer, and I have my loops. The reason this is on a 90 
This is designed that when the beaver pulls this way, it'll go down. When the beaver pulls this way, it won't go back. So as he pulls down to the bottom, he can't get back up. A beaver is designed that they cannot drown. Once they're underwater, their body shuts, does whatever it does, that they cannot inhale water. It's humans and other animals, when you drown, you're underwater, you're breathing, you're sucking in water. Beaver, sorry, beaver actually suffocate. They use all the good air in their lungs. That's why when you, find, when you trap a beaver, you may see the, the back end floating or the beaver floating on the top because he's still full of air. It's not sinking down to the bottom. So you're actually suffocating wow. the beaver at the bottom of the line. And that's your intention with a drain. They call it a drain to get it to the bottom of the line. So you have your ring on each end, and you always want this, this piece of metal pointing to the water. them up. Just like that. That's like advertising for the beaver. They see that green? You just stick them in there too. If this was wide, you could actually funnel the beaver with sticks to your area. But this is really good enough because he's not going to go fight all this when all this is here already. So you've narrowed it down where he's going to be. This is normally up. going to come right into there. So now you have your trap. And I like going for the hind foot. On a caster mound set, the beaver's going to smell the caster. And the way they get rid of the other person, or the other beaver's caster, they cover it with mud. He's going to go to the bottom, scoop up mud, and he's going to swim up here, and his chest is going to hit the bank. As soon as it happens, his back end is going to fall, his feet first. 
to get stable and try and walk up the bank with his back feet. That's where you want your track to be, where his back feet are. It's going to be lunchtime after this. Okay. Just let you know. Fine. Is that your track? Yeah, <laughs> People say, tip your finger out to your elbow, that's where you want to be. Because even if it's a bigger beaver, you want to be away from the bank for his front feet, but you want to be far enough from the bank. If you're too close, you're still going to walk forward. You just don't want to catch those front feet. So even if he puts his back feet down here, he's going to walk to get on the trap. You don't have to bury the trap. You just want to make sure it's secure. You don't have to put anything under the pan. You're just laying it on the top. So it really is not angled on rocks or anything. Clear it out with your foot. Just make a nice level spot. When he comes up, he's going to hit that with his chest. Back feet are going to go down. If they're back here, he's only using his back feet. He's going to walk right off that bank to that caster. And that's what you're shooting for. Once the trap is sprung, Drag that down. He's going to try and get back. The bag won't let him. He's going to go back. He's going to take him underneath. That's tough to do. That's what I like about this bag. The cheek. The grain. You don't have a burlap sack. Uh, what sack? Some guys used to use the burlap because they would deteriorate in the water. They would just leave everything there. These are just cheaper burlap bags. Usually run you around a buck a piece. These are more than no more than 40, 50 cents. So that's it. There's not much to it. And the other thing is dragging the beetle around. As far as we have in the past, I've always case skinned the beaver. My buddy, he always would case skin them, cut them down the center. I've always case skinned them. And then, now that the trend seems to be going to case skinning the beaver, flushing them like you would a coon on a flushing beam where you have the jaw and the forehead to hold it on the beam and you spin it and you do all your flushing on the beaver and then you split it draw down to the butt and then it lays down. People seem to be going that way. It's much easier to flush on a beam than that big disc because you're constantly always, if you have a case going from head to butt when you're flushing, when you skin it out in the circle, you're spinning it and you're going basically against the, the fur you wearing gloves once you start catching animals. You don't want to have bare hands on animals, but um, if it gets if it's too cold out, then you can just go pair of rubber gloves, like elbow and stuff, or you know, shoulder length if that's what you need. I usually have both with me. So, um, in terms of straps for coon, I use almost strictly use these uh, um, grizzes or the, the technical name is actually foot encapsulating traps. Right. Okay. Foot encapsulating traps, the actual name. A lot of people call them DPs uh, or Grizzes. Grizz is the first to come out with them, right? DP meaning dog proof. I highly advise in life that you don't put the word proof behind anything in a sentence because I don't think there's such a thing. Um, I've caught cats, skunks, and possums in these. I haven't caught a dog yet. I'm just waiting. I think it's going to happen. So I don't really believe in dog proof. I will say this, though. Um, they have traps with... They have traps with a pull trigger, which is this. This is the old style Grizz, right? And then they have some traps, like the Dagger and the newer Grizzes have a two-way trigger that fires the trap off regardless whether you pull or you push the trigger. Well, that pushing automatically almost makes it non-dog proof because if a small farm dog sticks his paw and starts pushing on the bait in there, it could set that trap off and he could get caught by the, you know, the toes. So 
I, I don't like the word dog proof. I do. I I will call them DPs just because it's kind of like ingrained in my head. But I don't. Just be mindful of the fact that I don't think there's such thing as dog proof. <clears throat> However, that being said, I believe that these are the best coon trap for the money right now. Okay? I don't think... These, these are a trap and a set all in one little package. And once Bill Duke from Duke Traps found a way to make them for a reasonable price, because the Grizz guy was just getting greedy, um, they became a hundred... They came a lot more attainable for the average guy. So, I, I think they're great. <clears throat> um, now, the way I anchor these traps, the way I anchor all, almost all my water traps, I like to use the cable, cable extension. It's just a uh, 3 second cable uh, with a double furl loop on each end, okay? And then to, to clamp it off, I like to use these quick, quick uh, clip carabiners. Um, uh, like most of your trap suppliers and Harbor Freight will sell them in bulk for cheap. Um, I get a hundred of them for like forty dollars. I got up at the state convention this year. Oh, if you got a Home Depot or farm store, they're going to be expensive. So it's up to you. But um, I like to I double you know I lark head loop through the terminal fastener down there. That's how I loop this end, okay? And then what I do is I just throw this end around a tree, or around a group of roots, or one big root, and just clip it on like that, okay? Um, <clears throat> and that's where it wonders over the last, I've been doing it for about six years now, that's great, it works really good. Um, if you go the other way, what I was doing before is I was looping around, running it through, like around a tree or root, and running it through like that, and then clipping the clip to the trap, and I had losses up to maybe 3%. So I switched around, and I cut my losses down to less than a percent now. I think the coon were just getting so torqued up sometimes that they were opening up that carabiner by just jamming the wire on it and getting out. Yeah. If you really are concerned yeah. about it, Scooter. you can just loop around a tree like this. this and this is completely up to you. Loop around a tree like that and your other loop on this end without the carabiner. You take this off. I'll show you how big that can be. So you just loop around whatever it is, a root, a root or a tree or bridge pile and whatever. And it goes around the tree like that. And he just has an extra J hook on his swivel. And he uses an X hook tool just to close the J hook on that. And then you know you're never going anywhere. Okay? Um, I don't. I find my losses are plenty low. That I like to quick uh, the carabiner, and I think it's a lot faster. So I'm sticking with that. So that's that's just the way I do. It. All right. With that now, double out, you could do it without the carabiner anyway. If you push that cable through far enough, you could just loop it back, loop the whole trap through it. You're right. Yeah. Somebody yeah. Else said that too. You could do it. Yeah. yeah you're right. Save you yourself the forty cent. Yep. If right. you're worried about. It. Yep. You could definitely do that. I'm big on evolving. Anybody that knows me, I'm always trying to get better and learn. So I'm always open to suggestions. It should always be that way, especially as a trapper. Things are always changing. Um, all right, now, uh, the way I set these traps, okay, I, I always set at least two per location. And the way I like to do it is I like to do a high-low. What do you call a high-low? Um, I'll set one up on the high bank. I was setting it up there. You were sitting before, but you don't have to move. It's fine. I'll loop it around a tree up there. I'll bait it up. And then I'll come down here, and I'll set the other one down by the creek. And that gives me, what that does for me is it allows me, if we get a heavy rain and it floods, this creek floods out, that trap is still active up there. Okay? This trap will be underwater, but if the cooter is coming through, I'm still going to make a catch. Okay? Uh... The other thing it does for me, one of the best times to catch coon is after a flood and the creek and the river or the creeks are all going down, the water's receding, the coon know, it's like built into their nature, that everything got stirred up that night when the water was flooding and the, the volume of water was so fast, it stirred the bottom up. All the freshwater clams, mussels, crayfish, all the fall fish that get caught in a little pond of water because the water went down too fast. 
that coon know that that's happening, it's going on. And they're coming in, they're going to hunt that creek hard that night. So if this trap was underwater for 24, 48 hours and got all washed out, you're not going to catch stuff in there. More than likely, you're not going to catch stuff in there. But if you still have that trap up there, when that big push comes, you're going to make a real good catch. Okay? Um, so I always recommend at least two traps. At the very least. I'll go upwards. You go upwards to six if you really have a lot of coon on. If you have a lot of tracks, if you're looking in the tree branches and you're seeing, or on the rocks, and you're seeing toilets, we call them coon toilets, um, and they look fresh, meaning they're real green, real yellow, it probably just happened in the last night or so, that's an awesome location, okay? They're really hanging out there quite a bit. It might be worth four traps there, okay? Uh, I usually don't go more than six. I usually stay anywhere somewhere between two and four. Um, a lot of times I kind of pick the direction I think they're coming. Like in this instance, I can almost guarantee there's a den tree in that clump of woods over there. Okay, it's a little thicker. Just kind of funnels that into some cornfields. More than likely, I think they'd be coming from over there. I'll put two sets here, maybe, and maybe a third on the other side of the road, maybe up high. Okay, that's usually the way I opt, the way I'll do that. <clears throat> um, any questions on that? So it's pretty simple. Now the bait. Most important thing about baiting these traps is to use an edible bait. It has to be edible. They have to want to eat it. Okay? Now, if you buy a bait from a trapping supply dealer, you have really no idea if it's edible. Honestly, you don't know unless you eat it. Right? I'm not telling you to do that. Because they ferment this stuff. When them a lot of it, maybe it's not good for you. More than like fish, fish stuff. But still you. Um, but you know things like hot dogs, marshmallows, even dog and cat food are edible. You know animals will eat it. I'll give you a perfect example, like vanilla extract smells real nice, but it's real bitter. Tasty. So you might have a bait and you don't even know it, but it smells nice. Coon reaches in there and starts eating it and it's like, eh. Throws that trap aside and it moves down the road. Okay? Um, you don't want that. Okay? I, I found a bridge here and it's on the wall of the yeah, well that's that's another way of doing it too. Yeah, that works real good too. But what I'm saying about these DP traps is, is that they gotta want to get in there and keep working until they fire that trigger off. So if they get a little taste of something and it's no good, they're going down the road. I found one of the baits I'm using right now, and I think it works real good. It's a combination of things, and it's all real cheap. Cheap hot dogs. Okay, and what I do is I go to Walmart, buy cheap hot dogs, I get a plastic container. In the barbecue sauce aisle, there's something called liquid smoke, all right? I'll take and cut the hot dogs one inch long and put them in a plastic container and I'll pour liquid smoke in them. I'll do that a couple days before I actually want to start setting traps, okay? I'll let that liquid smoke soak in. That hot dog and liquid smoke is killer, and they love that stuff, I'm telling you. But what you can do, the nice thing about these traps is you can pre-bait them and pre-set them. So, like, the night before you're going to start setting traps, you take those hot dogs and spear, spear them right onto the trigger, okay? And then you set that trap, wrap your, all your rig around it, and put it in your crate, and everything's half ready to go, okay? And then what I'll do is when I get out on the location, <coughs> I'll anchor my trap around my tree or my root, stick my trap in, and the other thing I like to use is some of those peppermint marshmallows or mini marshmallows, okay? I think after Halloween they start coming out with the peppermint ones. They seem to work the best. I'll put some peppermint marshmallows down in the hole, and then I also, to finish it off, I like um, the cheap pancake syrup from Walmart. I'll just take the pancake syrup, I'll smear it in the hole, right on the lip of the thing. Multiple baits, okay? What that's doing for me is he first gets there, he licks that pancake syrup, says, ooh, this is good. Then he gets into the marshmallows. Wow, these are great. Maybe he starts to get a little tired, and then bingo, at the bottom, right on the trigger, is a hot dog, okay, with some liquid smoke on it. Now he's got multiple things going on. He's always keeping his attention, okay, until he bam, pulls that hot dog and gets caught. All right, and they're all cheap, readily available, easy to use, okay. You see it right inside the bank like that. Yeah, that's, I'm getting there on, into that next. Um, Can you put dog food around that marshmallow in, too, or no? 
Uh, no, I, I got away from the dog food for a little while there. I mean, that works. It worked for me, but it just seemed like this was working better. Okay. How, how full do you fill your... About halfway. Halfway. Yeah. So hot dog on the trigger and marshmallow halfway up. Yep. And then some pancakes to it. <clears throat> on top of that. Yep. Now, um, getting back to that high-low thing I was talking about. I did, I did talk, yeah, I talked high low. I'll have one down here and one up high there. The one thing I will do in between us, I'll, I'll, I'll piece some trailing sand in there. Not pee, but uh, spray some trailing yeah, sand in there. I like to use fish oil. I'll get right. around well, behind you over there. Put your hand um, yeah, let me see that. Thanks. I'll just squirt it between the two tracks from the low side to the high side. That kind of connects those tracks, okay? So if I get a coon and coming down this creek and he gets caught in this set here and he's thrashing around making all that noise at night because you know a coon can be, they can make a lot of racket, right? The single greatest attractor to an animal is another animal in distress. So another coon comes in, sees his buddy down here, Fred, getting all tangled up, hits that trailing set, boom, he goes right up. You can have the opportunity to make multiple catches. The most I ever did in one location at night was five, all within ten feet of one another. So. One time. One, one time. Yeah, one night. Yeah, it was a whole family group. Yeah. <laughs> a whole family. Oh, I've got a photo. Um, I don't want to get some more. Now, the other thing you could do, up on dry land, you don't have to get real crazy with this. I'll, I'll make a couple points about it. You can literally bake this trap and just put it on the ground. Coon's going to pick it up and start working it anyway. It doesn't really matter how it is. However, a couple points. If you get it horizontal, now like if you stick it in the bank down here because you got a bank, if it rains, it doesn't wash your bait up or fill out with water, okay? If you can get it up on a fat leaf, okay? Stick it, stick it pretty well. And what we do now, you still have to anchor your trap off for correctly, right, to a tree or root. But if you stick it on a fat leaf, you put a little zip tie around it, a small skinny one, right? Keep it there. 12, 16 inches off the ground, and you're going to miss a lot of the non-target animals. Skunks, possums, cats. They eat with their mouth, okay? Coon can stand up on its hind legs on its butt and reach into your trap and get caught anyway. Okay, and I'm not saying that it's 100% guaranteed you'll miss that, those animals, but it's more likely that you will, okay? The other thing you'll miss if you elevate the trap, too, are your mice and rats. When you start using these traps, and you find that your bait got completely cleaned out and never got sprung, it's more likely a mouse or a rat, okay? Because they can get in there, and because it's tension higher and they're small, they may not set that trap off and get caught. So if you elevate the trap, you'll eliminate a lot some of that non-target problem. And the other thing you can do, if you're up on dry land don't have a sapling, these styrofoam cups work real good. If you put a cup over the trap like that, <coughs> First of all, it's eye appeal because it's a white thing in a sea of brown and green. So coon like that immediately anyway. It still smells. Coon don't care if this cup's there. He's going to come and pull it off and throw it out of the way, maybe play with it, and then he's going to work the set and get caught. But if this is on here and you jam it on there a little bit, more than likely the mice and rats, now they could chew through that. I've seen that these cups get chewed up a little bit. But it may slow them down until the coon gets there. Okay? The other thing this does it starts to rain or snow and sleet to keep that stuff out of your trap, okay? So they, it, your bait's still working. That's basically about all I do for my coon. Um, it's, I mean, it, it, it's basically that simple, okay? Um, and that, that's what I use about 100, almost 100% of the time anyway, okay? Speaking of that inside of the bank, you got to worry about dirt or anything getting in the spring or? Nope. No? Mm -hmm. Well, remember, that's not the spring, right? That's just the, the way to stick it. The spring is up here. Yeah, just don't yeah, I mean, too far. You have to, yeah, right. You have to, you, I, I, let, me re, let me correct what I say. If you jam this thing in up to here and you freeze, you'll lock that up. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you don't want to do that. I like the Dukes, actually, because they got that single post coming out. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of Dukes now, more than I have these bridges anymore. This is one of my originals. So, um, yeah, you got to lock it and you'll freeze that thing now. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so, yeah, just be careful with that. I mean, that's about all you do with that. So, uh, any questions on the DP trap? Can you just set them with the uh, hands? You don't I mean, I use a pair, like, see those gloves there? 
And the only reason I use those gloves, it's not for scent control, is because you don't want to get all that animal juice on your hands. You got oak and cuss and stuff on your hands. You don't want saliva on your hands. Because, you know, they carry, they, they carry diseases like rabies and things like that, and they come from their mouth. So you want to wear gloves to protect yourself. Don't worry about scent. Scent's not an issue. Okay? <clears throat> so just use gloves to protect yourself. Um, a lot of times, if it's not that cold out, and it's the first day I'm setting, I'll set with bare hands all day. But once I start making catches, I'm, I'm moving over the gloves. I prefer to use bare hands, but um, not when I'm making Put it down, not when I got animals down there, right there. You want to protect yourself. You don't want to get sick. All right. All right, now, any other questions on coon trapping or DP traps or any of that? Okay. What is that? Yeah, you're looking for the trap. Yeah. Dad, I had Alright, it's for a little meat trap. Is this for winter? In the forest? Uh, like I was saying before, mink is like, that's something to brag about. The they're not hard to catch. You get more and more of them. And I, I think they're fun to catch. Coon's kind of my staple okay. when I'm in the water. But coon, I, I will always set when I start seeing mink come. Okay? Is it, is it, now, mink. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I mentioned this before, not I'm not sure, but I've done this six times out of it. Eat some of it. The buck mink, the, the yeah. mink or male and female are called buck and doe, just like deer. Okay, you okay. didn't know that. Um, buck mink, they're like the big boar coon. They're just travelers. They, now, they may come back through again, but they'll travel distance. So if you miss them tonight, you may not see them for a week or two. That's how far they're moving. Doe are a little bit different. She may have a den somewhere over. <clears throat> down the creek 500 yards down here. You may miss her tonight. You may not see her tomorrow night or the next night, but she'll be back within a couple nights, okay? So, but what I'm trying to get at is just, I want to catch them make as soon as they come through. I don't want to miss them. Maybe I only have four nights to trap, you know what I mean? I don't have two weeks to sit on the mink line, especially mink because you know they're two and four between. But, um, I trap mink let me back up and talk about the trap. If I'm going to pick an all-round trap for all three animals, whether it's a mink, muskrat, coon, the one and a half coil spring I think is the best. Yeah. Okay. Again, if I'm trapping just coon, I'm going with my DP traps. And for years, for coon, before the DPs came out, I used my number 11 double long string. These are a good all-round trap for all three animals too, um, but I think the one and a half is a little bit better. So. Mm -hmm. I'll still use these, don't get me wrong, because I have a hundred of them or more, but <clears throat> I'm going to use these up first, okay? Huh? Uh, I use two basic sets for mink. I use a blind set and a baited pocket set for mink. Now, when I set mink, I always, always use a baited pocket set. I always want to try to get his nose involved if I can. Um, now, I don't get crazy with my pocket set, so I don't one over here. If you can get a deep pocket set and go for it, but don't spend a lot of time on it. I mean, six, eight inches is plenty. I would probably go a little deeper than this, but I hit a boulder back there, so that was the end of that. Um, way I set for me. Now, remember, I'm still anchoring my trap like I was going to catch a coon. you got to always anchor for the biggest animal you can run into. Right? Now, obviously, I don't... Mink's not going to take this far. Even if I left this thing laying here and didn't even anchor it, he's not going to get far with it. It's going to get tangled up in the weeds. He's not a strong animal. But if I catch a coon, he'll go halfway across the county with it. So I want to make sure that you anchor for the heaviest animal, right? The biggest animal. The way I like to, I dig my pocket. I like to have water in the bottom of my pocket, or most of my bottom of my pocket. Okay? When I set my trap, I like the primary jaw, which is the jaw with the dog side, facing out towards the tree. And I put my leaf parallel to the creek. So, so I set the trap for mink right inside the hole. I like it right in the hole there. Okay, now the mink's a slender animal. So when that mink's yeah, coming down, he's hugging this bank here. Okay? And because I got that trap in the hole, he's going to go right across that pan to get in there. When it comes here, it makes that turn. He's going right across that pan to get in here. I probably would even have this a little narrower, but I... I opened it, I mean, the rocks kind of fell apart, so it got a little bit bigger. I'd almost want it even a little bit narrower than this if I could. Um, the thing with mink and coon trapping is that it's different for each one. So, I could still catch coon in this step, but this is not how I would set a pocket set for coon, okay? Because a coon could come up to that, 
He could almost literally step in front of the trap, reach in the hole, and pull the bait out because the trap's so close. So the way I remedy that for coon is I set the trap back six to eight inches out from the face of that pocket, and now I catch that coon, but guess what? That mink could blend himself in there and you miss the mink, okay? So there's nothing that's 100% guaranteed for any animal that I've catched multiple different types of animals. However, how do I rectify the situation? Well, this is how I do it. I take and make that pocket set for mink. I put that trap in there like this. I'm going to catch that mink, and I put some DP traps up here so I catch the coon before he even gets to that pot. That's how I do it. If I'm walking down a creek and I'm just setting traps, it's Thanksgiving break, I'm out there setting traps, and I know I can trap all three animals, well, I'm going to get my coon up here with my, with my DP traps, and I'm going to try to catch my mink in my pocket set. Okay? The way I like to bait mink is I like to use uh, uh, chunk bait fish bait, okay, for me. Um, and you can get all the free fish bait you want by just going down to the creek or the farm pond, okay? Sunnies work great. You gut them out, chop them up. The head and the tail are awesome because they're like good eye appeal. The mink sees that tail sticking out. The watcher exposed bait, you know how to do that, right? But he sees that in the hole. He wants to investigate. He wants to get it. However, paste bait, there's nothing wrong with paste bait. Dave's got a real good one this year. It's called the Trout Oil Paste Bait. This is going to be a killer bait, okay? Um, the nice thing about paste bait is if you smear it up in the pocket with your hand, they really got to work to get at it because it's smeared all over the place. It's not just one piece, okay, where they can just pull out and get on the road, right? So that is something nice about that, but you do have to spend some money on it, right? So you could go to the pond and get all the free bait you want. Chop them up, put them in the freezer in little baggies. Be quiet. Like maybe that, maybe enough for like 20 cents. And you take a bag out at a time, right? Because um, like last year, Dave and I went up there and caught 50 sunfish, and I had like a buck and a half of bait, you know. So I didn't. I put them in smaller containers and take out what you need at a time. Too loud. You just turn it I would just jam it up there with my fingers in the mud. You could take a 16 penny nail and try to stick it. I don't bother. I just don't do it. But if you stick it, he'll have to work it a little harder. Right. It's not something I usually think to remember to bring. But uh, the other thing I like to do is I like to spray some fish oil up on the top ring of that rim of that hole. And I do like to use gland lure for mink. Um, Dave has a gland lure called White Chin. Uh, it's a great, great gland lure. Really smells minky. You put some on a little twig and shove it in the pocket. That's all you got to do. All right. Now, let me show you. The other thing, two other things for blind scent that I would do for me, okay? Um, so I'm always going to put a pocket in for a main location, but I'm also going to look for some blind scent. Now, I want my pocket to be as close to this focal point as possible. So, but in this case, I have big boulders here. I couldn't do anything with it, so I want as close as I could. However, Mink will travel down these creek banks and be real tight to the cover. He'll walk up here, he'll come down in here, he'll hug in here, he'll go like this, and bam, I got a rock here, right? I got a rock sticking out, pushing him out in the water. That, to me, screams blind set, okay? So what I did was, is I took a rock, because it was so deep there. I put the rock in the water, and I put a chunk of sod on top of it. And they like maybe two to three inches of water, <clears throat> okay? I put that trap right way up against that rock edge there. Now, I'll anchor that trap off like I would anything else because right. I still may catch a coon in there, okay? Now, what I do, though, even though it's a blind set, just to slow them down, I'm going to squirt some fish oil right on that face of the rock. It slows them down, concentrate right over that trap and get caught. Now, you could even, this is a good spot over here, too. See, it's got like a natural pocket right here. I may just tuck a, a trap right in there Maybe you try to bed it a little bit because it's a crayfish. Or even put it out in the point of this rock here on a piece of side. I would probably set both. Because I don't know which side he's working down yet. Okay? So, I always got my bait is set, but I'm also looking for some blind locations. Like I said, it could be two weeks before right. that big buck comes back, back again. I want to catch him to death. Move back, buddy. All right? I don't want to wait two more weeks. That, that'd be kind of like something he was saying with catching that coon on that bridge. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can still catch a coon there. I've done that. You know what I mean? Um, but I'm trying to put these CPs up here and get the coon before he gets in and messes my mink. Now, the last blind set I'll show you for mink, if you want to come around this side, audience, 
You see this con bear inside this culvert. The cotta bears that I, the stabilizers I like to use for cotta bears are these uh, pieces of steel plates that they make up and sell. I think Dave carries them. Um, basically, you take your 110 trap and you, you squeeze the spring and the jaws come around and they cut the bottom of the stabilizer. Then you set your trigger on top. And then I just take a piece of 16th wire cable, loop it in the hole and, and furl it off and run it over the trap chain. When it, and this will stabilize it. What's great about these is if you have a concrete bottom or a steel culvert pipe bottom, it don't matter because you just sit there. They're heavy so that that trap doesn't move. Now, I still feel like funnel them off. I put a rock on that side, a rock over there. I want them to get in into the center of my trap. I'm funneling them down, okay? Now, bear in mind something here. I would typically have this pushed in the culvert about maybe 12, 18 inches, okay? I don't want it right up front here. And the only reason I put it up front here is so you guys can see it easier. I want that mink to get up into the culvert without a lot of trouble and then go right through the center. If he sees this whole mess here, he may try to climb up this side and go that way and miss my trap. Okay? I want him to get in there a little bit, so I'd have that push in a little bit. Note the other thing. This stick here is called a jump stick. Okay? What that prevents is the mink, if you sometimes just have the con of bear, he may try to jump over it. All right, so I put a jump stick two, three, four inches above it to force them back underneath. Okay, put some grass there, try to make it look natural yeah, and not too, uh, not too crazy looking. And no lure bait there. I want them in stride. I'm not even going to slow them down. I want them to go right through. Okay, and I, I would probably set that up in this pipe and put these two sets here and in my pocket and in my TPs, and I'd be on my way. Okay. I try to get the coon to mess before they mess it up. And you may have to put one on each side to really do that right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it depends. You have to look at the situation. You know what I mean? Like, I think the coon will more likely come from there first anyway, so I probably will put two here and then set my mink set. Okay? That's basically what I use for mink. Now, there is a set. It's called a bottom mink set, and I can't make it here because I don't have the right condition. Okay. But everybody's seen at a bridge where the concrete bridge walls go down into the water, right? And they go all the way down until they hit the creek bottom. Actually, they go below the creek bottom. But you have the creek bottom. Mink will come into the water and go on through that bridge. And what they like to do is they actually like to dive down and swim right along that corner where the bridge wall meets the creek bottom. Okay, and what you can do is just put a set like this. Stabilize the conibear bear right in the corner there. Okay? Oh. What's that? Sometimes the concrete goes down and it goes out. Yeah, right. Instead of on that concrete. Yeah, and then you may want to block it's three feet deep, four feet deep. They'll swim right along that bottom corner and then come up later on down the creek. That's what they like to do. I've seen it personally. I've seen video of it. A lot of mink trappers, they, we call that a bottom edge set. A lot of guys exclusively set that way. That's a good set, but I incorporate all three types when I'm trapping mink. I want all the opportunity I can get. Another little trick, and this works pretty good. If you're using those bottom edge sets, I'll use it with this muskrat trap, but it's the same same principle. I had a buddy of mine do this last year, and it worked pretty good for him. Sometimes, because it's three feet deep, even two feet deep, you can't see those. You don't really know if you got anything unless the mink is the chain long enough and he's floating up there, but he could get jammed up on something and be floating underneath. What my buddy did was he took those uh, those pool noodles, you know, the foam noodles for the pools, swimming in the pool, playing around with the kids, play with them. He cut them like maybe two inches long, and he sliced them in the in the quarters. And he took a piece of mason's line, like braided mason's line, like four feet long, and he ties it off to the end of the spring here, and then runs it through the noodle. He did this all pre-season, of course. Okay, he just jams that noodle in here, sticks it in here, and then sets the trap underwater. When you make that catch, that noodle floats out of here and comes to the top of the water. If you see that orange chartreuse noodle floating, you got something. Or something sprung your trap off. Okay, sometimes these bottom edges get clogged with chunks. Sometimes you catch fall fish in them. You know, but I mean, that's a good idea. It lets you know something's going on. So. Is that trap right there big enough for me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a 110. That's where, that'll work fine for me. You can use 160s, too. 160s are a bigger trap. Um, but if you have a big run or a big spot, you need to narrow down. I usually carry some. However, what I like to do with the bigger traps, and you could do it with 110s too, 
is that hobby wire, it's like, I don't know, 032 wire, it's a real thin wire, right? Yeah, you put a, uh, they call it a mink trigger. And what you do is you just buy the, the electrical supply at the Home Depot, will have the shrink wrap tubing, you wrap it around with a piece of that shrink wrap, you hit it with the torch, sucks it on there, works great. And then on the bigger traps, you definitely want to do that because that's a, the space between the trigger and the jaws becomes bigger and the mink can slender his way through. It's like a slide. So, <clears throat> any questions on that? That's how I do my mink trap. You said where you see mink sign. What's mink sign? Okay, mink sign <laughs> is uh, it's traps. Okay, yeah, you've seen coon tracks before, right? Yeah. You know what a coon track looks like. You know what a possum track looks like? Yeah. Has a drop toe, right? <clears throat> Mink tracks look like a paw print. I mean, it's a paw, not really toes. But then you'll see five little dots in front of it from the nail. Okay? And they're small. They're about maybe like that big. Okay? Or, you know, your coon prints are a little more like that. You know what I mean? They're kind of similar. You could get a little confused with squirrel prints, too. But, you know, usually you're not seeing squirrels down in Culver. So, I mean, you might, but... Um, other than showing you, I mean, I have to show you in a pole, but, yeah. If you see those... I didn't that, know they dug it or anything. Or you, you see that little paw print with those five little dots, what? man. I mean, I you're, you're got mink in the area. Well, I had, I, a couple years ago, mink dead on the road by my house. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> dead mink, it's dying. Yeah, I it. <laughs> a farmer called me up last week for Christmas last year. Gave me a big buck mink in front of his house. A big one. It was nice. <clears throat> So mink are fun. Mink are a lot of fun to How catch. How many do you most to get? Oh, not a lot. I only last year I, I got three last year. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well that's it. You know what I mean? But I'm mostly if I'm water trapping, I'm mostly I'm hitting a coon. If I see some muskrats and mink sign, I'm hitting that too. But you know, I, I'm I mean, the tracks. Well, you can if you yeah if you I don't concentrate too hard on it. But if you concentrate on it, you catch 20, 30 of them. You know, I mean, if you really want to. So, mm -hmm. I spend most of my time on the fox mm -hmm. line, actually, to be honest with you. That's my staple anymore, but um, I'll hit the coon quite a bit, too. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?